Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm looking forward so much for this session. Um, my goal is to give you as much resources and as much tools as possible for you to pay less tax in your property portfolio. Ladies and gentlemen, tax is such a hot topic that even the Beatles sang about it. So um, we are going to talk about tax in this session. We're going to talk about how you can pay less tax and how what you can do to build a property portfolio in an efficient manner to pay as little taxes as possible. I want to start with one thing and that is one thing before we jump into the meat and that is talking about our mindset and our approach to paying tax because um, I will never forget when I was in finance I was CFO for an international wholesale firm and I had a mentor was a CFO of a JSE listed company and he would always tell me Yaku there's one thing worse than paying tax and that's not paying tax and I always well, I was always confused when he said that because what does he mean by that and eventually I realized oh that makes sense if you're not paying tax it means you're not making money so you actually want to make money you want to pay tax so first and foremost before we speak um, in this session about all the ways in which we can reduced paying taxes. Let's remember that we don't want to subconsciously limit ourselves in expanding and growing by trying to avoid paying tax. Paying, tax, paying taxes should always come secondary to how do we expand, how do we build, how do we increase. You've heard me speak about tax deductible expenses. Now what a tax deductible expense is, is the expenses that you can actually deduct from your income before your tax is calculated on, on what, is, what is left. So um, I'm going to run through a couple of the typical expenses that you would have in an entity that owns property. So a property investment entity, a property investment trust or a property investment company. Now firstly, one of your biggest expenses and believe it or not, a lot of people forget to deduct this is the fact that a big portion of your monthly bond payment to the bank, to be more accurate, the interest, which is the majority of the bond payment in the early years, is a tax deductible expense. So you've got your rental income. That is one of your main incomes that you will show. You've also obviously got your properties that appreciate in value, value but that is what we call the unrealized gain because you don't get taxed on the appreciation the capital appreciation of your properties until you sell those properties. So your main income that would be regarded as income in your property entity would be your rental income. Now you've got your bond payment and of that bond payment, that payment that you make monthly consists out of two parts, a capital portion and an interest portion. Obviously the capital portion is non, not tax deductible because it is a loan that you are repaying. But as I said, the biggest part of that bond payment is the interest expense and that is a tax deductible expense. So we would look at the mortgage statements at year end when we prepare the financial statements and we will make sure that that is deducted. Then you've got repairs and maintenance uh, ladies and gentlemen. Those are things like wear and tear, upkeep, electrical, plumbing, painting, even tiling in some instances. So all the things that you need to do to keep your property uh, to keep your properties in a suitable or in a good condition are expenses that you can deduct from your income before you pay any taxes. So obviously the improvements are excluded, ladies and gentlemen. So if you bolt on and it is seen as an improvement, then that would not be regarded as a tax deductible expense. But your general wear and tear, repairs and maintenance, like the, those things that I've mentioned, are all things that are tax deductible um, that you can deduct from your rental income before taxes are applicable. Then you've got service costs. You've got all kinds of service providers that you use in a property portfolio. That could be your rental agents, that commission that they charge monthly to collect your rent and to uh, source tenants for you. That's a tax deductible expense, ladies and gentlemen. That is something that you can deduct on your income statement before tax is being paid. Also legal consultation. You might need to appoint attorneys to assist with evictions or with contracts, whatever the case may be with structuring costs. All of those are tax deductible expenses, ladies and gentlemen. And 
Then of course you've got the insurance on the property and, and those kind of costs as well. Then ladies and gentlemen, you've got your utilities, your electricity, your water, your rates and taxes to the municipality. All of those are things that forms part of your property portfolio expenses that are tax deductible. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to get to the more creative ones, things that a lot of people don't think of. Think about maybe the MacBook or the iPhone that you are using to run your property portfolio on. That MacBook can be depreciated over a couple of years, and that can be an expense that you put through your property entity if that item is used to manage your property portfolio. The same applies to your phone. Even the internet that you use um, to send out invoices or to look for property, that is a business expense, ladies and gentlemen, and those are things that can be deducted. We can even take it a step further. If you have to get office furniture or furniture that you need to use in your office that gets used for, for running your property portfolio, the depreciation of those assets is a tax deductible expense, ladies and gentlemen. So now I wanna talk, ladies and gentlemen, about structuring your property portfolio because different structures has got different tax implications. And it is so important that we discuss how the different entities and the different structures is gonna affect you with trust. So I've got a slide up here that speaks about the three different ways in which you can buy property and what the tax implications are. So you can buy property directly in a trust, you can buy property in a company, and it's always advised that if you buy property in a company that a holdings trust holds the shares in the company. And the reason for that is you don't want any assets on your name. And, the sh and shares of a company is an asset on your name which is exposed if something goes wrong and which forms part of your estate one day when you pass away. So either you buy property in a trust or you buy property in a company, but then the shares are held in a trust. But then there are also people that buy property in their own name. Now let's talk about the tax implications of these three approaches. A trust is taxed at 45% and the inclusion rate, the capital gains inclusion rate, in other words, the percentage of your capital gain that forms part of taxable income is 80%. Now, most people see that and they think to themselves, well, that's it. That makes sense. I shouldn't use a trust. But that is not accurate, ladies and gentlemen, because if you read down, you would see we refer to what is called the conduit principle. And how the conduit principle works is that any profits that a trust make can be distributed to any of the beneficiaries and that profit or that income, it retains its nature in the hands of the beneficiary and the beneficiaries then pay tax in their personal capacity, which is then on a scale of 0% to 45%, depending on where your tax bracket is at or that beneficiary's tax bracket is at. And your capital gain, very important, ladies and gentlemen, your capital gain inclusion rate drops back to 40%, which means that only 40% of your capital gains, if you are selling a property at a profit, um, only 40% of your capital gains is included in that beneficiary's um, income for tax purposes. So even though a trust is taxed at 45% with an 80% capital uh, gains inclusion rate, often a trust is your best structure to pay the least amount of taxes because of the conduit principle and because of the fact that the profits that the trust make can be distributed to the beneficiaries and the beneficiaries then pay in their personal capacity. I can give you a couple of examples. It may be that you are looking after one of your parents and they are already retired, they've got no other income. Now instead of you um, sending your parents money with after-tax money, in other words, after you paid 45% tax on it, you could send their money directly from the family trust and there will be no taxes in the trust and your parents would need to pay tax on what they have received. But because they don't have any other income, they are on a much lower tax bracket than you, number one. They are on a much lower tax bracket than a trust and they would have been on a much lower tax bracket than even what a company would be. On. So that is a great way for you to drastically reduce the amount of taxes that you pay on profit or capital gains for that matter. Now, the same applies if you have, for example, children. You have two children that you want to send to university. Um, your costs for, the, for, for each of those children might be, let's call it 200,000 rand each. So you've got 400,000 rand that you need to distribute through your trusts to your children because they don't have any other um, taxable income that means that 
that 200,000 rand would be the only income that they need to show. It has been distributed out of the trust, which means the trust is not going to pay tax on it because the children only receive 200,000 rand for that year and nothing else. They are on a very low tax bracket. And the reason for that is you've got your tax rebates and you've got all of the exemptions. And when you apply all of that, you will pay significantly lower tax on that, on, on that method even than what you would have paid in a company. So there are many distribution options. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, when you own property directly in a trust, then you've got a company. Now, the great thing about a company, ladies and gentlemen, is that you only pay 28% tax in a company. The capital uh, gains inclusion rate, unfortunately, unfortunately, is still 80%. And you can't get around that because you can't distribute that anywhere. So the the problem with a company is you've got much less distribution options. Now, what that means, it's more difficult for you to get those profits out of the company. Yes, the tax that you pay within the company is little, but how do you get it to you? You can declare a dividend, but then you have to pay an additional 20% after the 28% that you've already paid on dividends tax. You can also draw a salary from the company, but remember, not anybody can just draw a salary out of a company. It, you need to be able to justify why that person is drawing a salary out of your company. You, for example, can't pay your five-year-old daughter a salary out of your company. Well, you can try, but you're taking a fat chance. So that is, that is a company then. And then lastly, you've got yourself. You can buy property in your own name. Yes, your income tax rate is lower because it runs on a scale from zero to 45% and your capital gain inclusion rate is only 40%. But the problem is you've got no distribution options, which means if you are on a high tax bracket, you can't distribute that to your spouse or to your parents or your children or your grandchildren. You have to pay the tax on your tax bracket. More importantly, however, ladies and gentlemen, and that's not from a tax perspective, but, but from a structuring, from a protection and estate planning pers perspective, owning properties in your own name doesn't give you the asset protection that you need, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't assist you with proper estate planning to build a legacy and to have continuity in your property portfolio one day when you are not there anymore. So, from what we have discussed now, ladies and gentlemen, you are basically sitting with two ways in which you can structure your property portfolio. You can either own the properties directly in the property trust. That's my favorite method. And for most of my clients, it makes the most sense to own properties directly in the property trust. Or you could, at a later stage, as your property portfolio grows and you don't have that many distribution options available to yourself anymore, you could own your property in a company but then a holdings trust, very important, ladies and gentlemen, will hold the shares in your company. Now, those are ways to own property. The family trust, which is separate from this, would always be necessary because the family trust serves two functions. Number one, all your personal assets that you will acquire over your lifetime will be held within your family trust. And number two, any money that flows from you to your investment entities would flow via your family trust. So you would donate as much as you can to your family trust every year, 200,000 Rand for a couple or 100,000 Rand for an individual currently. And whatever else you push in there, you would do as a loan account and then donate against that loan account annually. And then your family trust, which is not a charity, is going to lend that money to your property trust or your companies or your other entities. And the reason why we do it like that is this is a very effective or a very efficient method to reduce taxes um, significantly because one day when your property entities are doing well and you want to move money back to your family trust where you can go and acquire personal assets and enjoy that wealth, you can do it tax-free because it's a settlement of a loan account. So that is a very, very tax-efficient manner in which you can do your structuring. I'd like to move on and talk about, and this is a question that I get so often, ladies and gentlemen, so what do I do if I have properties in my own name and I don't have the right structure to take advantage of all of these tax benefits that I can have in an entity such as a trust or in some instances a company? And often we need to look at restructuring a property portfolio like that. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to restructuring. The advantages to restructuring your property portfolio is threefold. Number one, 
you can get the asset out of your name, which provides better asset protection. Number two, you can get the debt out of your name. If you don't have debt in your name, it enables you to build a bigger property portfolio. And number three, you can make a lot of capital available through the process. So those are all benefits of restructuring your property portfolio. But there are also a couple of disadvantages um, when you restructure your property portfolio. And those would be costs such as transfer fees. In some instances, if your uh, property is worth more than the threshold, transfer duties. Then there will be bond registration costs if you are taking out new bonds in the entities. Um, and there could also be capital gains tax applicable. So it's very, very important, ladies and gentlemen, when you look at restructuring your property portfolio, that you focus on that. And that is something that I assist my clients with, is I sit with them in a consultation and we actually look at their property portfolio and we look at this restructuring options that are available. And then we determine whether it makes sense for us to restructure or not. And what those costs would be, how much capital we can make available, and we put the correct structures in place then in order to have a more tax efficient vehicle uh, to bolt this property portfolio on. Now I wanna talk about refinancing for a moment, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of times people miss the opportunity that there is in refinancing your property portfolio and how that can enable you to, to, to um, save a lot of taxes. So I, said this many times before, I don't like selling property. Selling property is like killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. But over and above that, it triggers capital's ga capital gains tax. So I want to make sure that instead of selling a property, I would rather refinance a property and, and in that way access the cash. Now the beauty of this, ladies and gentlemen, is when I refinance a property and I get cash, let's say I take two, three, four hundred thousand rand out of a property by refinancing it, the beauty of this is, ladies and gentlemen, that money is not taxable. So I, in effect, access the capital of a property without paying capital gains tax on it. And that money can be used to expand my property portfolio further. This is how most property investors across the globe has bought significant property portfolios with paying very, very little tax. They make sure that their leverage ratio or their gearing ratio, in other words, their debt to assets ratio, is managed at such a percentage that there is not a lot of realized profit in the company or in the trust. That does not mean that you are not making money because you can still make a lot of unrealized profit through the capital appreciation and you access that through refinancing that you can, that, 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 that you can access. So that enables you to access the capital without necessarily paying tax. So let's talk about it practically. What happens when you refinance? So we all know what refinancing means, right? Let's say you have a property that's worth a million rand and you owe 800,000 rand on that property. You could go to the bank and say, bank, I've got a property that's worth a million rand. I only owe 800,000 rand on it. I would like to borrow another 200,000 rand. Now, when you borrow that 200,000 rand, that's cash that is made available for you. With that cash, there's a lot that you can do. You can spend it <laughs> if you want to. You can put it in the access bond so that you don't pay interest on it. You can use it for transfer fees and registration costs for your next investment properties that you want to buy. You can even use it to cover your monthly shortfalls if you have shortfalls on your property. In effect, if you take that money out and you don't put it into your access bond, this is what happens. Your bond increases. That means your cash increases. Also, your interest expense, because you have a bigger bond now, increases and that pushes your net profit down. And when your net profit goes down, your tax goes down. So by refinancing, you make capital available and in the same, in the same time that you are making capital available, you're also reducing the taxes that you are paying. And that money then can be used to reinvest further to build your property portfolio. So that's a great way for you to, 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 to grow a property portfolio tax-free is by using um, refinanced funds to, to expand your property portfolio. Thank you very much. Goodbye.